give okay. it a try again. Thank you. See if I get drawn on again. All right. Uh, so yeah, um, as I was saying, uh, cloud developer advocates, and I do everything uh, related to Rust. With that uh, being said, I'd like to give a shout out to my employer so that uh, I can continue to pay the bills. Um, but also, uh, there's a really great thing for those in Austria. There's um, a bunch of free learning resources, um, some classes that you can go ahead and, and learn about Azure. And um, as well as is the theme of the talk today, it's all about learning. Um, so if you want to go ahead and take a look at that, then uh, feel free to take a look at that link. Um, and with that, we can get started. Before we really dive into why you should care about Rust, I want to have a couple of quick disclaimers for everybody, because when you're talking about how great a programming language is, oftentimes those conversations devolve into how terrible other programming languages are. That is not what I hope to accomplish today. Um, so the first one is that there is no perfect programming language. Rust has a ton of flaws in it, just like every programming language. Um, but learning those flaws is a lot of fun. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about them today, but part of the discovery of learning a new language is to learn why it's not perfect. Um, I think everybody should use what is right for the job that they have at hand. And it depends on what job you're trying to accomplish to know which tool you should use. Um, and, and Rust could be a really great tool for a lot of different jobs. And I think one great thing about the language is that it actually does a lot of things really well. Um, but there are some things it doesn't do so well, and there are other languages that do things better. So um, when you're looking to pick a programming language for a certain thing, um, don't just take somebody's word for it. Do a little bit of research, um, figure out what you think will be best for getting the job done. And when in doubt, use whatever makes you happy. So if you use Rust and it makes you happy, as it does for a lot of people, including myself, then that is it's in some ways reason enough. Um, you don't really need to justify it beyond that. Um, but uh, you know, if another language makes you feel happier than Rust does, then don't feel bad about using that. Um, it's all about uh, you know, creating cool things, having fun, um, and uh, we don't always have to worry so much about uh, if we're using the right thing all the time. And lastly, um, learning can be an end, not just a means to an end. And what I mean that by that is that sometimes it's just nice to learn new things, even if you don't have a reason to learn them. Um, I have had several times in my career where I've learned new technologies, including Rust itself when I first started learning. Um, I didn't have a reason to learn it. Uh, I didn't need it for my job. It was uh, 0 0.10. It wasn't even really usable for production yet. Um, uh, but I chose to learn it just because I like learning. Um, and it's worked out uh, really great for me. I now get paid to, to write in a language. But even if that didn't happen, sometimes it's just nice to learn and it will have positive effects um, later on in life um, and also can just make you happy. So let's not take this too seriously. So with all that being said, I'm going to go through several different languages um, that potentially you program in day in and day out and talk a little bit about if you are coming from that language, what you might like um, about Rust um, and a little bit of what maybe you won't like about the language. So the first language we're going to start, start with is the C programming language, which is an oldie but a goodie. And C has been around for quite a while now and is used um, in a lot of things, but especially in kind of low level um, use cases. And especially nowadays with, you know, the rise of C++ and then of course the rise of garbage collected languages like Java, C Sharp, and then going on. Um, now we have uh, a whole bunch of languages that we can choose from that we'll talk about later on. There's less and less um, need in a, for a lot of programmers to use C, but it's still used a lot today for a lot of different reasons. Um, and that might be things from microcontrollers to airplanes um, to uh, operating systems, and a lot of different things are written in C. And that's really great. One terrifying thing about that is that um, C is a very dangerous language and you can very easily make mistakes. And that's something that um, as a C programmer you might love uh, about Rust, is that Rust is 100% memory safe. Um, what do we mean by memory safe? Well, if you've, if you've done Rust uh, C programming before, you know about things like use after free or double free. These are common mistakes that you might make when you're handling memory management. And because in C, memory management is completely manual, you as the programmer are in charge of it, um, you can make mistakes. 
Um, and uh, one graph that I like to show on basically all of my talks now um, is this graph. This is a graph of uh, CVEs, so um, security vulnerabilities at Microsoft specifically. Um, and the percentage of our um, security vulnerabilities that have to do with memory safety versus not memory safety. So um, a lot of C programmers out there are very proud, which is good, uh, but they're very proud that they don't make mistakes. And if you make a mistake in C, it's because you're an idiot. Um, we have proof uh, that either most people are idiots or that uh, everybody makes mistakes. And I personally don't believe that uh, everybody is an idiot. I just think most people make mistakes. Um, and so even if you think you are a perfect C programmer, the likelihood that you will always work with other people who are perfect C programmers is very low. Um, and therefore, using a language where it is very easy to introduce um, memory safety vulnerabilities, and as we see uh, across time, roughly 70% of those at Microsoft um, tend to be uh, memory safety issues, um, this can be, can be quite dangerous. And, and this isn't just Microsoft, but this particular data is just Microsoft, but um, when talking with Google, Apple, um, uh, basically every big, um, uh, software engineering uh, company in the world, the figure tends to be around this. And so this is why you see more and more companies looking into to Rust because um, we need secure software. Um, and it is a bit of a shame that we're still using a language that um, where you can end up uh, uh, so easily introducing um, vulnerabilities. Um, so I wanted to take a look at a little bit of code today. And if you've never written a line of Rust in your, in your life, um, don't worry, we're gonna go line by line here, but it's just, don't, don't get bogged down in the details, just let it kind of wash over you and give you a, a chance uh, to, to see what uh, programming in Rust kind of looks like. Um, but uh, hopefully this will give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, so uh, up at the top of the screen, um, we have a person struct um, and just like in C, uh, your person struct um, can have fields on it. And we have uh, two fields, name and age. And name has a string attached with it, and age is, is a 8-bit um, unsigned integer that we have here. And we're going to talk about this like uh, single quote A thing have right here. This is kind of the whole point of this exercise. Most of the time, you won't see this kind of weird syntax. But um, for our purposes, for this example, it's very important, actually, why this, this uh, tick A, as we like to say. Um, is here. And then we're going to have a parse uh, function, which takes in a string and returns back an optional person. And um, if you've ever done any parsing before, you know that parsing might not work. Um, the string that you're passing in might not actually be parsable. And that's what this option here is. Option is simply a type that wraps another type and says, you either have that type or you don't. Now in C, you probably will would use um, I don't know, maybe a, a null pointer or something like that, or a, a special value in Rust. We're very explicit about everything. Um, and uh, you tend to not have special values uh, in Rust. You tend to either have a value or you don't. And this is what our, our parsing code looks like. It's very easy um, to, to, see, to see what it does. We initialize name and age to both be none. So we don't have a name and age when we start. Um, and then we get the lines from the string, and this is just a simple function that breaks up our string based on, um, based on new line characters. Um, we map over that string, so for every single line, we do something to that string, and what we do is call the trim method on it. And what trim does is remove white space from the beginning and end. So by the time we have this line here in our for end loop, um, what we have actually is a line, uh, a single line at a time that does not have white space at the beginning or the end. And then we ask if the line starts with name colon, then we go ahead and get the rest of the line. Um, and that is our name. And we wrap it in the sum, which means, hey, we now have a name. And the same for age. If the, if the line starts with age colon, then we get um, the, the line starting at right after age. And we trim off any extra white space that we have there. And that's our age right here. And so what you can see with, with this is it actually seems quite high level. Um, and we'll talk about this later on in the talk, but the great thing about Rust is this, this code does seem 
rather high level. And in fact, um, I tried to write it a little bit low level um, so that it wasn't too weird looking for a C programmer. But at the end of the day, Rust code tends to be high level, but it, it compiles down into um, code that performs and generally works just like it does in C. Um, and uh, this week I've been doing a lot of embedded programming in Rust where basically every instruction counts and even there, um, we get to write this kind of really high level code and it ends up um, turning into code um, or assembly code that, that resembles what you would get if you were to use C instead. Um, and so that's kind of a theme with Rust. You can have your cake and eat it too. Um, you don't have to make a lot of the trade-offs that you've had to, to make before. Then at the end here with a question mark that's simply saying, if the name's not there, return back um, a none at the end and same with age. We parse the age as a number that we have right here. Um, and so at the very end, we end up with a person and otherwise we would have propagated out our, our none here. So this is very high level code um, that we have here, but it, again, it compiles down to pretty uh, efficient assembly code, something similar to if you were to have written it in C. Um, but what happens if we do something silly like this? And, uh, and of course, all the examples that I'm gonna be showing today are quite simplified. The reason for it is I don't wanna spend an hour, half an hour explaining a complex example that you would run into a real world, but hopefully you get the idea even with simple examples here. We, uh, in this code right here, we create a stack allocated string um, that, that contains our kind of unparsed, uh, you know, person content here. And then we call the, uh, the parse function here. Now, if we go back to the previous code, what we're saying with this tick A line here is that the lifetime of person is attached to the string that's inside of it. So however long this person lives, then the string inside of it needs to live at least that long. And this is a, this is a great thing about Rust if you're coming from a C or a C++ background. These concepts that you've thought about before around lifetimes, for instance, are really formally baked into the language. So in C, you often think about, I allocate something on the heap and I need to free it at some point and that the length of time in my program that it lives until I free uh, that, uh, that memory there is its lifetime. But in C, that's just in your head or in documentation. There's nothing in the language that really enforces a certain lifetime. It's just simply when I call malloc and when I call free is its lifetime. But in Rust, we actually have that banked, in, banked into the language. And so this on, uh, on the parse line here says the input string is a, a pointer to a string, a reference in, in Rust parlance to a string and its lifetime is tied to the lifetime of the person that we get out. So however long the string that we pass in need, needs to live, the person that we get out from this function needs to live the, the, at least that long, um, or sorry, at most that long. And this is enforced by the compiler. So when we write something that should not work here, we allocate this string here, the string is living on the stack here by the time uh, that it gets to the end of the function, in Rust, you don't have to explicitly call um, free. It gets done for you at the, at the end of the function, um, just like in C++. Um, if we were to do this right here, we would return out a person that is tied to the string, which has been allocated on the stack. And that, if you're a C programmer, you should be going rah, rah, wrong. You're going, to have, um, you're going to have a dangling pointer here. We're going to... Uh, at the end of this function, free our string, but we're going to return a person which is referring back to that string that has now been freed. And that, you, you can't do that, this is a bug. In this case, happens to be a very easy bug to, to see, um, but you know you can imagine much more complicated uh, code and Rust will, will statically enforce this. This is all static, there's no garbage collection, there's nothing going on here, it's just static. Um, uh, check here that's happening. And, and in fact, this is the, the error message that you end up with here. Um, we cannot return a value referencing a local variable, which, you know, if you're coming from the C background should probably seem pretty, pretty straightforward. Okay, yeah, I know I can't, I can't return something that refers to something that's been allocated on, on the stack. That's, that's wrong. Well, now you have a compiler to always make sure that you never make that mistake. And that's really great. And as we saw in the uh, back here, it seems to be an issue that um, 
uh, that a lot of developers actually make um, and ends up in, in a lot of pain for big companies like Microsoft. Um, and what's really great about this language uh, is that theoretically, if we, if we were to use Rust for everything, all 70% of those bugs would just go away and we would only have to deal with the 30% that, that remain. Um, which is, you know, if uh, it's not really practically possible given the amount of C and C++ that exists in the world, but, um, but uh, you know, theoretically we can start working towards that goal of getting rid of 70% of bugs uh, that, that exist today in our, our most fundamental systems. All right. Um, yay, we can party as C programmers because we never have to, to seg fault again. We never have to write something that, uh, that you know, we never have to to get in our debugger because we hit a seg fault for some reason. And it, in fact, in Rust, by default, um, there is a, an escape hash we can talk about. But by default, if you write Rust, you will literally never ever have a seg fault and, unless you hit a, you know, you're using a buggy library or something like that, or, um, or the standard library has a, has a bug in it, which I don't believe the standard library has had a bug that could seg fault in a while now. So, um, so you never have to worry about a seg fault again. Which is, which is really great. All right, what about C++ developers? Um, Rust definitely has a lot more concepts that kind of um, uh, go in with, um, with, with C++. And in fact, uh, uh, this whole thing about dropping at the end of, of a function, it kind of reminds you of the RAII pattern that you have in C++. You can just imagine, take away all the baggage of kind of older C++ and only have um, the, the kind of newer, more, more safe, more um, you know, high level concepts that you have in C++ nowadays. Um, so you end up with a dramatically simpler language than C++ is um, with all the benefits and um, there's really no way to, to, to mess it up because there's no kind of older code styles that you have to worry about. So as a C++ developer, I think what you're really going to love besides all that memory safety stuff is uh, the default build tooling that, that Rust comes with. And, uh, I know we'll talk about this in his talk um, coming up. A lot of it has to do with Cargo, the, the build tool, but we're gonna take a little bit of a look like that. Um, here's uh, us testing our, our function that we had from before, our parse function here. And you can see in this code, um, built into to Rust already is a way to write unit tests. And this is default. There's no extra thing to download from Google or whoever. Um, you just get it right out of the box in the default tooling and you can run tests. And of course the, the CFG at the, the top there is a compiler flag, which means at the end of the day that when you actually build this for, for production, this all just goes away. So you don't actually, you don't pay um, a price in your, in your end binary. And you get to, to run your tests and you get this nice test output um, where you can see that our test pass, which is really great. We don't have any doc tests, but there are also documentation tests as well um, because uh, documentation is built in um, and, and we're, real great. we're ready to go. And in fact, when we build um, our program, we just have to cargo build dash dash release um, here. And uh, as a new Rust programmer, don't forget the dash dash release if you wanna do some benchmarking or something like that. That's a, a common mistake that people make. Um, by default, uh, cargo builds in debug mode, which is has optimizations um, largely turned off. Um, so we can go ahead and uh, build a release build of our binary here. And cargo also comes with run and, and a bunch of other features that I know we'll, we'll surely get into later on. Um, so that's really great. Um, and in fact, uh, here we have our cargo.toml file, which is a, a file that describes our project. And it's a very standard file that everybody in the Rust world knows about. So you don't have to learn different build tooling systems and, you know, what's the next flavor of the month. Cargo is it and it's here to stay. Um, and you can add dependencies very easily. You see on line eight here, I've added the nom library, which is a great parsing library. Um, if we don't want to do parsing ourselves, but rather want to, to you know, use a library to do that, it's as simply as adding this one line then what Cargo will do is go ahead and fetch um, uh, the dependency and all, all of the, um, the dependencies that that dependency uses as well, build them for you. And there's, a, I think, a lot of reasons why um, C and C++ programmers try to avoid dependencies um, is because you end up with a lot of build headaches uh, because of that. But in, in a world where, um, where you have uh, kind of standard build tooling, then you can end up in a, in a great situation where, especially in the beginning of a project, pull off some things from the shelf, go ahead and get your project uh, running. And you know what, if you don't wanna have that many dependencies at the end of the day, that's fine. 
but you can start with those and then get rid of them as you go along um, if that's you know if, if you need to uh, if you feel the need to um, but this is a really great way to get up get up and rolling and it's all built in out of the box you don't have to kind of configure anything it all just works um, which is really wonderful all right, so we talked about the C and C++. I think, by the way, C and C++ are, are the languages that I would most strongly um, encourage uh, people to, to give Rust a try. The reason for it is because Rust is explicitly trying to fill the same kind of areas that C and C++ currently do. Um, uh, they, it wants to be a language for writing operating systems, for writing um, web servers, and by that I mean something like Nginx. Um, uh, it wants to build um, low-level systems. It's a systems programming language, and that is the area that C and C++ currently occupy. These, the next languages we're going to be talking about, Rust can do a lot of the same things there, but there, it's definitely not um, its first and foremost goal to, to kind of um, compete in the same space. Um, but for C and C++, it definitely is, and so, you know, give it a try. Why not? Yeah, I think you'll, you'll like what you find there. So now we're going to be talking about C-sharp and Java. The reason that I combine these two together is because they're both garbage collected languages. They both are object oriented languages. They come from, you know, the 90s, early 2000s. Um, so they have a lot of in common there. Um, and one thing that I want to talk about there is thread safety. Now, C-sharp C and Java have uh, garbage collectors. So this whole thing about memory safety, you don't have to worry about that with, uh, with C-sharp and Java because you have a garbage collector to take care of that for you. Um, but what you don't uh, get in C Sharp and Java that you do get in Rust is the idea of thread safety. So Rust by, by default is 100% uh, thread safe, meaning that you don't get any um, data races happening. You never have unsynchronized um, access between two threads to a piece of data. You will, uh, the language guarantees that you have synchronized uh, access between things in memory. And so I want to show an example that has nothing to do with threads, but I think um, because threading can get a little bit complicated, I wanted to boil it down to something that I think is related to why um, Rust works this way. And here is a, a thing that actually, um, I haven't done this in C Sharp, but I know in Java throws an exception. Um, we, we take in a vector, which is basically an array, um, and we're looping over it. And we decide if the item that we currently get from that vector is above five, we're going to push a new item onto that array. Um, and uh, you know, if you've programmed in Java or C Sharp before, or probably any programming language, you might know what this bug is. This is a concurrent, um, uh, a concurrent modification error here, um, which typically in other languages would be a runtime exception, where we would detect, oh, you're trying to change the thing that you're currently iterating over. Well, in Rust, you can see uh, on line four there, barely, that there's a little bit of a squiggly line there. It turns out that in Rust, um, the compiler stops us from doing this, where we cannot, um, while we're iterating over an item, um, push something onto it. And the reason I wanted to show this example is because there are, there are a lot of things that fall out of uh, Rust's ownership uh, model, um, the borrow checker that you may have heard uh, stories about. Um, that allow you to, to write code uh, fearlessly, where you can write something like this, and if it's a, ter a terrible idea that actually this would end up corrupting your vector as you, as you iterated over it, um, the compiler will stop you from doing it. Um, this, this code just does not make sense. Um, and the compiler tells you, instead of waiting for runtime checks to, to catch that error. And same, the same thing with, uh, with threading. Um, you have no data races that you have to worry about. Um, and because of this, you get this fearless concurrency where if you need uh, something like a mutex or, or some, uh, some other concurrency primitive to make sure that data is synchronized between threads, the compiler will tell you, hey, you're, you're not doing this. Um, and if you think that you're, you're smarter than the compiler, which most of the time you're not, uh, I've, I've learned that the hard way, um, there is an escape hatch that you can go for, but 99.99% um, of the time you don't need that escape hatch and the compiler is, is correct in, in telling you um, you're doing something wrong. All right, now we're gonna be talking about Go and, and Node. Um, I, I picked these two languages because they're kind of like server side, um, you know, five, 10 years old now. Um, used for a lot of web servers and stuff like that. People compare Rust to Go all the time, probably because they came out around the same time. Go is only three-ish years older than, than Rust is. Um, 
uh, I would argue that Go and Rust are very different languages from, from one another, um, meant for very different things. Um, but one thing that I wanted to talk about as a, as a Go or Node developer is the robustness that, that Rust can offer, um, and a, a robustness that, that, that these other languages um, don't make a point of trying to provide uh, to their users. Um, and uh, this comes through a powerful type system, um, robust error handling. So if you're a Go programmer, typically the, the old you know, joke about Go is that you have to check for, for nil every, um, you know, every other line. Um, Rust uh, does not, uh, has much more kind of uh, succinct um, error handling than that. Um, also, you know, we talked about Go not having generics and things like that, although, although it's coming, of course, um, Rust has that baked in. Um, and, uh, and also there is a kind of, um, uh, rough mentality in Rust that, you know, if it compiles, it works. And, um, you know, of course this isn't, this isn't true. Um, but, um, sometimes it feels true, uh, for sure. Um, where you spend a lot less time debugging your programs. Now, when you're learning, you're going to spend a lot of time fighting the compiler and getting your code to compile in the first place. But the good thing is that as you learn, that happens less and less. Um, and so one quick negative part of, about Rust here um, for, for Go developers that I think in particular will not find it that great um, is that Rust is, is definitely not as um, uh, simple of a language or is not as uh, small of a, a language. There are more concepts that you have to learn um, in Rust. And the reason for that is because Rust is trying to do something very different than Go is. Go is particularly made for um, server-side web uh, applications um, and uh, and Rust is made for um, low-level systems and so there's a lot of things that the Go um, language can kind of abstract away from you and give you good defaults that Rust can't because it needs to give you the control that, um, that uh, you need in order to use it as a systems language and so um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second but uh, something to look out for. Here's a, an interesting example of, the, of this robustness. This is reading to, to a string here. This is a, a re-implementation of the standard fs read to string function here. It takes in a path and it returns an io result of string. Now this io result, um, as you maybe can even tell, it's a result of doing an io operation. It can either succeed or can fail. And that makes sense, right? Reading from a file system can succeed or fail. So it would be strange if it didn't, if it only returned back a string. And Rust doesn't have exceptions. Um, so we can't just throw an exception and uh, you know, document, hey, this might throw an exception. Rust is very explicit and says, hey, this thing might succeed or fail. And you know that on line eight by seeing IO result there. And then on each line, we kind of follow the happy path where we're opening the file, we, we allocate a string buffer, we read to that, that, that string buffer, and you'll notice on line nine and line 11 there, the question mark at the end. And that's our error handling for this file. We basically want to say, if it, at any point there's an error from doing this thing, just bubble it up to the user. Um, and just with one little character, we get to say on line nine, for instance, open the file, and if it fails, just return back that error to, to the caller of the function. And so you get the kind of, um, nice shorthand of writing code like it had exceptions or something like that, but the robustness of knowing that the caller of this function can't forget to catch the error because they are forced to deal with the fact that there is an error, or they can pass it along to somebody else, but, but, um, but the robustness is there for guaranteeing that that error is dealt with in, in some way, even if it's just a, a tilt of a hat to say, I understand you can error and I'm going to pass the problem on to somebody else. That's what the question mark uh, operator does there. All right, now we're going to be talking about Swift and Kotlin um, as two languages, kind of very, very modern languages, two uh, languages that I in particular have uh, really enjoyed programming in in the past, um, for, uh, in particular for iOS and Android development. Um, and I think what you'll love if you're coming uh, from these two languages is the control that, that Rust offers you. Um, this is sort of the, the opposite of the reason that you probably love Swift uh, and, and Kotlin. Swift and Kotlin have really great uh, abstractions that allow your code to still be very performant, um, but you don't really have to worry that often about things. Um, the, the languages do a really great job of kind of abstracting over a bunch of common concerns like memory management for one, 
um, uh, and, and you can kind of focus on your core um, programming. But the unfortunate part of that sometimes is, is sometimes you need to know exactly what's happening in the machine. You want to know how many times am I allocating to the heap? Is this variable going to be on the stack or on the heap? And in, um, in these other languages, um, sometimes you know for a fact that it will always be on the heap in, in the case of a garbage collected language generally. Um, or you know, you're not sure, it might be stack allocated, depends on the optimizer, blah, 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 blah. Um, when you're doing low level systems programming, you need the control um, that, that uh, a language like Rust can afford to you. So that's really fine grain control over allocation, um, zero cost abstraction. So you still get a lot of these really great abstractions that allow your code to be elegant, readable, maintainable, um, where you're not writing thousand line functions to do one small thing. Um, but at the end of the day, you know that your abstraction doesn't cost you anything um, or, or it's very clear about its cost um, so that you know ahead of time how much you're paying in terms of performance, um, speed, memory consumption, so on and so forth um, when you're using these abstractions. And in other languages like in Swift and Kotlin, sometimes that can be unclear or you have to be an expert in the language to really un understand it and it might change from, um, from one release to another and you have to always keep on top of this. Um, most of the time you don't want to worry about that, but when you do, it's nice that you have a language like Rust where you can um, know exactly uh, what kind of runtime performance you're going to get. Um, and at the end of the day, you're still going to have sensible defaults. So most of the time you don't have to worry about this stuff, but when you do want to worry about it, you can worry about it, which is, which is really great. All right. Um, now to, to go to a really different language, um, Python and Ruby. I, uh, my very first language that I ever learned was Ruby, uh, where I learned Ruby on Rails back in the day um, and still have a, even though I don't write any Ruby anymore whatsoever, um, I still have a, a fond place in, in my heart for, for Ruby just because it's so fun of a language. And I know a lot of people also enjoy um, writing Python, although I've not really had the pleasure of doing much Python. Um, I think what you'll love uh, about uh, Rust is it's fast. <laughs> um, that's typically um, what uh, comes to mind uh, when you're thinking about um, Ruby and Python is that they're not the fastest languages in the world um, because typically they don't need to be, um, except sometimes they do need to be. You know, if you have a, a Rails application running out there, you have a Django application, or you've got a, a machine learning model um, that you, you, um, you know, worked up in, Python, in a Python script real quick, and now you really need it to be quick, um, it, it would be nice um, if you had a language that could interact very easily um, with your Python or with your Ruby um, and allow you to write safe code where you know that you're not going to get in all the icky problems that you would get into if you were to write C or C++, um, which causes a lot of Ruby and, uh, and Python developers to stay away from native extensions to their, um, to their packages. Um, it's nice that you would have something like that in Rust. Um, Rust is fast. It's, it's a very fast language. Um, it's generally in the same ballpark as C and C++. Um, and in fact, sometimes it's even faster and, you know, how can that be? Isn't C the fastest language in the world? No, it turns out that um, C cannot make a lot of optimizations um, inside of the compiler because it just doesn't have enough information to do so. Um, and it's, it's a real testament to how amazing uh, a lot of C and C++ compilers are that they're able to take um, a language um, that is very kind of very loose in its rules um, and able to to get it up to uh, are able to do some of the optimizations that they're that they're able to do um, in, in Rust. There's simply just much more information um, available to the optimizer and the compiler. Um, and I don't want to say that Rust is fully taking advantage of of this at the time at, at the current moment. Um, but this, I think the theoretical upper limit uh, of, of performance for Rust is higher than it would be. Um, for C, C and C++. Let's see if one day um, it achieves that, but you can know that um, you're at least getting kind of in the same realm as C and C++ when you write Rust, which is, which is nice to know. And, and, you know, why would you give up your, your beautiful Ruby or beautiful Python code for another language? Well, you want to do it to get some performance. So it's nice to know that you'll get that with Rust. 
Um, a quick shout out to a, a, a project that I've actually not used before, but I think it's so cool. There's a bunch of, there's different ones for different languages. And I, I picked this one because there's been some, some tweeting happening about it lately. This is uh, the, the PIO3 um, uh, uh, crate, um, crate is the term for Rust package. Um, and this allows you to write Rust code and easily embed it into Python or to embed Python in your Rust uh, code as well. Um, and, and it's really great. This is what some example code looks like here, where you can just simply annotate a, a, a Rust function with Py function or a Rust uh, function with Py module, and then be able to add you know, native Rust code into a Python module and to be able to use it simply from Python, um, even though it's implemented in Rust, um, where you don't have to deal with the, the you know, nasty C FFI that you would have to do uh, manually if you're writing this in C or if you were to do the thing manually in Rust even, you get a nice um, abstraction over that that allows you to write these uh, Rust functions and use them from Python um, and uh, in a very easy way. So I think that's really cool. And there's, there's uh, projects like this for, for Ruby as well and, and other languages as well. So something to, to check out if you're, if you're looking for a reason, maybe you can take a look at rewriting some slow part of your application that's in Ruby or Python and, and write it in Rust and see if you get a performance uh, gain from that. All right. Um, and I think this, uh, the last one that I'm going to be talking about is uh, JavaScript and TypeScript, um, two also fantastic languages that I, that I have written a lot in my, uh, in my career and I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed writing. Um, I think what you'll really love about Rust is that you finally get a choice. Um, uh, for a long time, really the only way to write a front-end application in particular um, was to use JavaScript. Um, and of course you had CoffeeScript and you have TypeScript, but those are just, you know, pretty face, you know, pretty face on top of, uh, on top of JavaScript. They're not too, too different there. And, you know, if you're adventurous or something like that, you might use something like Elm, um, which I also enjoyed using. Um, uh, and, you know, there are, there are more here, but I think uh, what's really interesting is, is using Rust as a, as a front-end language um, through WebAssembly. Um, and in fact, that's a, something that I've done in a project before here, um, writing a um, Game Boy emulator in, in Rust and embedding it. And this is a, a browser page here. Um, I gave a talk uh, about it at a uh, Ruby conference um, two years ago. So you can look for that on YouTube, um, where I talk about uh, building uh, an emulator in Rust, um, putting it into a, a web page. And of course, the UI is still in TypeScript. Um, uh, you can write it in Rust, it's just a little bit more, you know, there's not a ton of reason to do it, um, but it is fun and you, the whole thing could be in Rust. Um, I decided to mix and match. And it's, it's a fun thing to write something like this in a, in a new language and have it work in the browser and, you can, and everybody can use it. So that's, that's really great. So with all that said, there's a couple of things that I want people to be a little bit careful about when they're, they're learning Rust. We, as, as this lady here is having a great time on her skates, but oh, you know, she makes a little mistake and falls over there. Um, that's definitely possible to do uh, in Rust as well. So a little, uh, a couple of words of advice here. Um, Rust is not Go. Rust is not C++. Rust is not C. Um, Rust is not JavaScript. Rust is not Swift. This is all, this is fine. These languages exist for a reason and they're all great in their own right. And so why would you want another language that's just like the language you already know? Some words of advice to you when you're learning Rust for the first time, take it slow. Um, Rust is not a simple language, um, uh, but um, it is a language that makes a lot of sense. So you just have to learn the rules. Uh, but in order to do that, you gotta take it slow. Um, you got to learn the basics before you start hacking. If you just go into Rust and sit without reading um, the book or, or, you know, listening to any tutorials or something like that, you're setting yourself up for frustration. So take a little bit of time to learn the basics before you really dive into hack. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to hack in the future with Rust, but at first, just learn the basics um, kind of the old fashioned way. Um, and reach out for help. I think this is the best part about uh, Rust is the community is so wonderful. And I'm happy that we have uh, more meetups uh, like this uh, in Linz um, that, that we can be a part of. Um, there's a ton of resources online, a ton of really great people who you can reach out to, and I'll give you some resources in just a minute. 
don't don't be afraid to 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 reach out um and if you have a bad experience come talk to me i'd be happy to to help out as well i really want uh, everybody to be happy um and comfortable um in in the rust community and i think um that we in the rust community are doing a good job um and and hopefully we'll continue to do a good job and get better at making it an open and happy and good and safe place for people to learn um, about computing. Um, here's some a couple of resources to, to take a look at here. The Rust Programming Language by Steve Klapnick and Carol Nichols is really great. Um, it's free, that's why I put it up here. There are other awesome books out there that you can take a look at, but this one you can just hop on um, and uh, you know check it out real quick before you decide to buy a, a hard copy of it. Um, there's also the, the Rust language website, which um, has a learn section with a whole bunch of different things like the Rustlings course, Rust by example, um, and a lot of links to places like our, the Rust Discord where you can get help and stuff like that. So check that out. Um, a shout out to um, this really great guy, Ryan Levick. Uh, not sure where he's from, but he does some awesome streaming on Twitch and you should definitely check him out. Uh, there are other people out there also doing amazing uh, Rust streams. So um, there's a whole community. Um, you know, come find us. Um, let us know what you'd like to work to learn about. I've been doing a lot of kind of intermediate uh, Rust uh, programming streams lately. But if you're uh, interested in a beginner Rust uh, stream, I'm, it's something that I'm thinking about doing. So just let me know. Um, and with that, uh, I think we still have a little bit of time for questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about Rust um, from any background that you might be coming from. Um, and, uh, and I hope you enjoyed my talk today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, we definitely enjoyed your talk. The, the uh, Discord channel was, was running over with messages uh, during your talk, uh, especially when you showed the C slide. Everybody was posting their favorite programming language, ranging from assembly to PHP. So <laughs> like the whole spectrum. Uh, Very nice. do, do you have any, anything what, what um, assembly or PHP developers would love about, <laughs> about Rust? I think for, uh, for PHP developers, uh, it's probably the same as uh, for Ruby and Python. So you kind of get to... Uh, <laughs> kind of the same thing happening there, which is which is really great. And for assembly programmers, I guess uh, you get to use a high level language. Uh, maybe you don't like that if you're an assembly programmer, but um, but yeah, uh, come join the rest of us where we have curly braces and if statements <laughs> and you don't have to worry about registers uh, uh, too much, so. Absolutely. And um, there were a couple of questions in, in the chat. Uh, if it's okay, uh, I, just, I just passed them along. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, so, so one, one very interesting question is, uh, in what ways is Microsoft actively developing using Rust? Um, yeah, so we've written about this a little bit um, in the, the blog um, for MSRC, and I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning of the talk um, and go back to this graph that I showed here. Uh, this is actually from the MSRC, the Microsoft Security Response Center. Uh, which is uh, the team in charge of security response at Microsoft across all of our, our products. Um, and uh, about two years ago, they took a look at this graph and got very sad um, and said, we've been putting a lot of money into making our, um, uh, our software safer, um, which has been working. Um, uh, we have, uh, we find a lot more vulnerabilities ourselves instead of bad people finding them before we do, which is good. That's, that's good. But what, Hey, wouldn't it be great if this number didn't, you know, if this didn't exist and we didn't have to worry about finding them before the bad people did because they just didn't exist in the first place. And so looking at this number where you see 70% of the security vulnerabilities are memory safety related and that from 2006 to 2018, and by the way, 2019 was the same. We didn't update the slide, but it's the same percentage, roughly 70%. The number is just not going down. How can we do this? Well, one possible way to do that is adopting a language uh, that where you literally can't write um, memory safety uh, bugs um, that could be using C sharp. And so one aspect of that is let's use more C sharp. Let's use more garbage collected languages. They get rid of these a lot of these issues as well. But we're writing Windows, we're writing Office, we're writing uh, Xbox um, games, controller, microcontrollers, we're writing firmware. A lot of these things, C-sharp is just not going to probably be the language that you want to use. 
um, because of its, its garbage collector. And so we need an alternative. Um, and so we, we went out in the world and found um, Rust as the best uh, alternative that we, that we can adopt. And we're, I mean, Microsoft is a slow and big company as most uh, big companies are. And so we're not going to rewrite everything in Rust tomorrow. Um, but little by little, more teams are adopting it. Um, I can't say, I can't say, I really wish I could say which teams in, um, are, are adopting it right now, but we, we're still not quite ready to, to make that public. There are a few like Azure IoT, um, that they write uh, IoT devices, um, as well as web servers that help you um, manage those devices. They are active open source users of Rust, so that's no secret there. But there are other teams inside uh, of Microsoft that are using, um, starting to use Rust um, and really seeing great results with it. And um, if we could just get my colleagues to write blog posts quicker, uh, then you know at some point we're going to be writing a lot more about that and we can start discussing which teams are using it. But I can say um, that not only are, are we seeing great memory safety um, uh, advances, we're also seeing uh, performance gains, which was, has been uh, really surprising. Now, if you were to rewrite some of that code in C++, you know, modern C++ or, or you know, the latest uh, way that you would write it in C, maybe you would see the same um, improvements. Um, but uh, the good thing is that it's not all about memory safety at the expense of something else. It's basically just positives that are happening with our adoption of Rust. Um, and so it's making the pain of adoption, which comes from adopting new tools, learning new things, um, taking on new build systems, blah, blah, blah so on and so forth. Um, it's making that worth it. And so the, the experiment has been very positive to this point, and hopefully we can share more about that uh, in the near future. When the big announcement comes, we are pretty sure that everybody in this room is going to say, ah, that's what Ryan meant back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, regarding the slide that you just have opened, Vladimir wants, uh, wants to know if you have any idea what happened between, uh, what are the numbers, 2009 and 2011 and 2012 and 2014? I guess where <laughs> those big spikes are in, in yeah. the graph, if there has been some something that, that changed or that, that got attention. Um, no, I don't have an answer to that. I think maybe my, my colleagues at the MSRC might be able to give a, a, a reason. I do know from what they've told me before that for some reason, security vulnerabilities tend to come in waves. Um, and they're not sure why that is, but it seems that uh, when you find one issue that tends to lead to others finding other related issues. And so that can lead to things kind of increasing in number and then you hit a drought and then it increases in number. So maybe it's, it has to do with that, but I'm not sure. Um, I have two more questions in the chat. Um, one is from, from Matthias who, um, it says that you showed screenshots using VS Code. And if you have ever checked IntelliJ, uh, and why are you using VS Code? <laughs> I'm using VS Code because I work for Microsoft, of course. No, uh, <laughs> no, um, no, I actually, a long time uh, user of Vim uh, and decided to switch to VS Code because frankly, that's what the, a large portion of the Rust community uses. Um, every year there is a Rust community survey um, and uh, I think for the past four years now, VS Code has been the most popular uh, editor in the Rust community. Um, and it's, it's a great editor. Um, I say that as a Microsoft employee and also as a, you know, just a person who uses editors. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great one. Um, I've not had the pleasure yet of using IntelliJ. Um, I've heard some, some good things about it, and um, I believe the person who is now writing the, what will soon be the official uh, Rust language server implementation was the original author of the IntelliJ mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, plugin for, for Rust. Um, and so, the, you know, it's all just a big party and everybody's, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's having a good time. So yeah. I, I think probably IntelliJ would be fine to use if that's what you're, you're used to. Very cool. Yeah, this is something that I noticed when, when starting in, in with Rust that the community takes care of a lot of things. So everything everything runs down to the same, if not people, the same organization and everything is, is collected at one place. And this was very, very inspiring. I haven't seen yeah. that in any other programming language so far. Yeah. That's, hey. uh, that's something interesting to, to point out real quick is that um, although Rust is, was started as a Mozilla project, um, 
for, for Firefox or originally for Servo and then for Firefox. And there's still a lot of people who are employed by Mozilla to, to work on Rust. Um, it is largely a community uh, collaboration. And um, even for people like myself who are, are employed by Microsoft and go into the Rust community, we're, we're in some ways first Rust community members and then you know employees of our employers second when it comes to, to Rust. Um, and I, th I think that's really great just because there's not a lot of this uh, kind of um, corporate infighting uh, between the different parties and the Rust community. Now, that might change, you know, in the future, um, but uh, Rust is getting more and more popular every year. And the, the kind of core of the community, the core ethos of the community has has remained the same uh, over that time. So I'm quite um, Quite happy and hopeful that uh, the, the Rust community can maintain this kind of real close knit um, sense, uh, even as you know the Googles and the Microsofts and the Facebooks of the mm -hmm. world come in and, and start participating as well. Cool. One last question before we we uh, switch over to to Rainer. Um, there has been a research project uh, called Verona, uh, um, a language project from Microsoft Research. Um, uh, how do you see Rust's future regarding Verona being on the horizon? Is it something that competes with Rust to that regard, or or is it you know just a research thing that might go go nowhere? Oh, um, so Verona is a really cool project. It's part of um, the the efforts at Microsoft that I'm a part of um, to make systems programming safer. Um, and for those that don't know, it's a, it's a project by Microsoft Research um, for looking into how to make systems programming safer. Um, now, why does Microsoft Research do research projects is a, is a good thing to talk <laughs> about. Um, they do it for multiple reasons. One is they do research and literally we pay them to learn more about stuff. Um, and I think that the that is the best way to classify Verona at this current point in time. It is a it is a research project. Um, try and use the compiler today, and this this is not meant to disparage the team. They're doing fantastic work, um, but it's definitely a research project, um, and that's fine. It's meant to be that. It's meant for us to learn more um, about it because it's the way that it handles memory safety is very different from the way that Rust handles it. And if nobody did research, then we would never you know, learn new ways to do things. So this, I think, is very important that we're able to, without worrying about fitting it into the Rust programming model, without fitting it into an existing language, um, the team is allowed to just create a new language and see what kind of comes out of it. Now, what will be the future of that? Um, there's a lot of things that have happened in the, in the past with Microsoft Research Projects. Um, the, the most common one, uh, unfortunately, is that they just get shut down because they've learned stuff and they don't need it anymore. Um, another one is that it gets folded into existing things. Um, and the third one is that it gets fully productized as its own thing. Um, I could see uh, Verona becoming any one of those things. Um, if it gets folded into something, I think I would love to see some of the ideas get folded into Rust. And who knows, maybe that will happen in the future. And if it get product, uh, gets productized, I am definitely a language pluralist. I believe that more languages is a good thing. And so, um, and I know uh, what the team is trying to achieve with, uh, with Verona is not to take over Rust. It is a very specific aspect of, of systems programming. So even if in some chance in, in five years from now or whenever, Verona becomes a thing, uh, a productized actual language that you can really write production code in, I don't, I would, I would be very, very surprised if that threatened the Rust position in um, in the industry today. And I, I, I'm not, I'm not worried about it at all. In fact, I'm hope I hope that um, we see a lot of things come from Verona because it's a really cool, a really cool idea and a really cool project. So, cool, very cool, uh, Ryan. Thank you very much.